My guest says 75% of his body was burned away, including his face. Not only were his face, nose, mouth, and lips supernaturally reconstructed, his earlobe grew back. Life after death experiences and angelic communications are on the increase. Terminally ill patients whom doctors have given no hope are unexplainably cured. People are being mysteriously protected from natural disasters. Sid Roth, your investigative reporter, examines this invisible world on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth. And my special guest is Jerry Golden. What a horrible experience, a plane crash, and 75% of his body just melts, his lips, nose, earlobe, face. I mean, he, his wife had difficulty looking at him, and I can understand. But that was not the beginning of his problems. As a youngster, what, six years old, you had an experience as a, uh, being Jewish with the KKK in West Virginia. Tell me about it. Sid, what happened was my father died when I was five, and my mother remarried a Gentile, Goim, and, uh, and he uh, had some friends that didn't appreciate him marrying a Jewish woman. Uh, his friends were Ku Klux Klan members, and they turned on him and played a visit to our home. They tarred and feathered my stepfather uh, he nearly died. He spent several weeks in the hospital getting the hot tar and the feathers off of him. What they do is they, they actually paint with big paint brushes, uh, all hot tar, mm -hmm. and then open pillars with feathers in them and throw them all over him, and then put him like a pig on a pole and walk him around the neighborhood. I was about six years old, and I, was, I remember uh, this, you, of course I would remember, hiding between the bed and the wall, and someone stood between uh, in the doorway, uh, I remember the, the white hood, and they grabbed me and drug me outside. They had already thrown my mother on the ground, slapped her around, dishonored my mother in the front yard, kicked me around, called themselves white, red-blooded Christian men. What did you think of Christians? Well, that and coupled with the fact that when I went to the first grade in Morgantown, West Virginia in, 19, in the early 40s, uh, with fingers pointed in my face and calling me a Christ killer, I remember coming home asking my grandmother, who is Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? I never heard of Jesus, and I haven't killed anyone. I related that to her first mm -hmm. and last name. She slapped my face and said, don't never mention that name in this house again. Now, at age 15, you became uh, Golden Gloves champion of West Virginia, and when you found out you were going to have a Christian as an opponent, what did you think? Right, that was a middleweight. That's poor weight, 245 pounds. I used to ask all of my opponents when, you, when they got in the ring with me, mm -hmm. are you a Christian? You see, my grandmother told me about Hitler and told me that he was a Christian and they had killed 75% of my family. And I felt like every time I could hurt a Christian, I was getting that much closer to this devil called Hitler. And they, almost everyone will say yes to that question, not realizing what it implies uh, when you ask them. And when they said, yes, I'm a Christian, I couldn't wait for the bell to ring. I'd shake the ropes till the post nearly fell down. You know, I look back said I was never really that good with my hands but I was driven with a hatred that was stronger than any other motion or motive in that ring at that time. Okay, when you were sent to Angola prison, that's not a nice prison no. in Louisiana, uh, for you were sentenced to what, 15 years? 15 and years. Uh, you, you actually didn't even commit a crime, you were falsely accused. Uh, and so what, tell me about the prison, what was it like? All right. First of all, let me say this, I was not exactly falsely accused, even though I didn't do an armed robbery or hadn't stolen anything, I knew all about it. And I mm -hmm. was guilty of a crime called accessory before and after the fact. Just the knowledge, knowing these guys was going to do that, made me guilty uh, I in the court. When I arrived at Angola, I, first, my first hour there, I saw a man killed for less than a half a pack of cigarettes, stabbed over 30 times uh, to his death for less than a half a pack of cigarettes. Realized very quickly, that I wasn't near as strong and tough as I thought I could be. I'd already spent four years in the 82nd Airborne, the Special Forces, had a black belt and several different styles of karate, and along with my boxing, uh, so I was a very violent, capable person, but realized that I wasn't near strong enough or tough enough to make it in this prison. I was going to have to get a lot tougher. And in the years that followed, I became, and this is, my, uh, this is one of those things that sounds like it's I'm bragging. I'm, I have to say what 
how low I had to get before Jesus Christ had reached down and touched me. I became the worst criminal they ever had in that prison. I owned every poker game, owned all the loan businesses, and if anyone dealt any dope in that prison during the eight years that I was there, they either gave me some of, uh, a cut of the profit or they was in big trouble. Okay, so you saw an advertisement from Criminals Anonymous, and what did you, just an advertisement, Criminals yeah. Anonymous, Anonymous, and you, you, what did you write to them? Well, there was a business card that said Criminals mm -hmm. Anonymous. Someone had laid it on my bunk. I said, well, that sounds like an interesting organization. By this time, I had been in Angola six years. I had resolved to the idea that I was a criminal. Uh, mm -hmm. At least I was going to be the worst criminal that they'd ever seen in that prison, and that was my total purpose in life to accomplish what they wanted me to be. I wrote this Criminals Anonymous organization a letter. I said, I'm just a poor little Jewish boy. I don't have any friends or no family or anything. How about sending me a watch and a ring and, and all of this like all these other people are having? I, it was a cheap two-bit letter from a cheap two-bit uh, uh, lost uh, uh, person in that prison. I didn't think anything more about that letter. But one day, you're walking in the yard, your pockets are filled with drugs, and one of the guards says to you, Right, I was on my way to the trusty yard. My pushes on the trusty yard had a pocket full of heroin, had it cut in small bags, and I was giving it to my pushes. A guard said, Jerry, there's a visitor here to see you. He's in a chaplain's office. I looked at him like he must be crazy. This particular guard was one of the guards on my payroll. He, he was making more money off of me than he was off of the state. I told him, I'm not going to the chaplain's office. I've been there six years at that time, Sid. I had been everywhere in that prison with the exception of the chaplain's office. Had no desire. I lived in a unit called Oak Three. No one in that unit went to church, and no one in that unit had a Bible that I knew of. If they did, I attacked. I was a great persecutor of Christians. No one could be around me very long if they were a Christian and be very comfortable. But I, I realized I had to go. If I didn't go, it was going to take me to isolation. They'd find out what I had in my pocket. I'd get some more time. So you're trapped. You go in, and yeah. you see an elderly man. Yeah. Can you believe God would trap a little Jewish boy in prison like this with dope in his pocket? I looked around the corner of the door. There sat about an 80-year-old man. His eye, face was pink. His eyes were just twinkling. His hair was snow white. He had a smile from ear to ear. He said he looked like he's completely, totally insane. Looked like he's just completely insane. I walked in there. I said to myself, they say I have to go in there, but I, no one says I have to stay. I was going to put some pain on that old man's hand. I had a very... This, what? You're uh, on an old man? You're going to apply pain? I was an animal, Sid. I was, this is B.C. This is before Christ in my life. I was a mm -hmm. real animal in those days. I was going to put some real pain on that old man's hand and put it down and say, nice to meet you, and maybe use a few of those words that I haven't had in my vocabulary in the last 30 years uh, and tell him how I felt about a few things and walk out of there. But I reached over there and grabbed that old man's hand, and he had a, for an old man, he had a pretty good grip himself, and he wouldn't let go. Every time I would try to jerk my hand back, he would just hold on tighter, and his hair was just vibrating every time I would jerk. And he started off, didn't say shalom. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know if he was a rabbi. I didn't know if he was a preacher or I had or a politician or something. I didn't have a clue who this old man was. He held up his left hand, and this is what he said. It became my, for 30 years of my preaching and, 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 and ministry all around the world, this is one of my favorite, if not my most favorite verse of Scripture. He said, by grace through faith are you saved in that, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not a worse, lest any man should boast. Said, I didn't know whether that was Shakespeare or, <laughs> or I had, didn't have a clue. I, I didn't know what this old man was talking about. I had never read a New, a new Testament, never heard that before in my life. But why did you just keep holding his hand? He wouldn't let go. If he lets go of my hand, I'm out of here. <laughs> See? And he but this is an 80-year-old man, and I, you're, you're I, a macho. I don't care. If he lets go of my hand, I'm out of here. I went out of this chaplain's office. Nothing but wall, Bibles all over the walls. I went out of here. I'm the most uncomfortable person that's ever been in this chaplain's what, office. What happened next? He says to me, he says, Jerry, and after a long witness, first of all, i got to say this. I went through so many mental changes right then. I didn't realize what was going on in my life then, but... 2020 hindsight, even in the spirit is 2020. The spirit of God was working on me mightily at that point in time. You know, it says by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free. Well, I was a Jew in prison. That really fit me. And I was looking at this old man, and suddenly I would begin to ask myself some very strange questions. What would it be like to wake up like that, with that look in my eye? 
What would it be like to be motivated? He told me that he just drove his car with 300 miles to tell me that Jesus was Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. And he told me a story that was almost impossible at that point in time for me to believe. He told me that the last night, the, that he'd been driving all night, he said last night an angel stood at the foot of his bed, this is a Southern Baptist man, and woke him up and told him to go to Angola, the Louisiana State Prison, and tell that Jew, Jerry Golden, that Jesus is Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. Mm. So you, you said a prayer with him just to get out, and he gave you a Bible, you left, and then what happened? He gave me a Bible. I found myself the next day in the boiler room. I had placed that Bible up in, up in my drawer in my office, had my own office in that prison, glass all the way around. I didn't, know one, I didn't want anyone to come in. Everyone knew I was a grouch, especially early in the morning. So I put the Bible in the drawer and opened it, put my elbow up on the drawer, and I was reading the Bible down in the drawer. No one could see me reading it. Had been reading it. Every time I'd look around and turn a page, make sure nobody but could see But why did you even say the prayer with that old man? Well, I just wanted to get out of it. Let me tell you how that ended real quick. He told me, Jerry, if you'll sign this card, your life will change. You'll be saved. I thought to myself, I'm right-handed. The only thing I'm going to be saved from is this hand grip he won't let go of. <laughs> so I told him, I said, I'll sign the card. He said, all right, let go of my hand. I signed it and scribbled it. It looked like Hebrew. I didn't want him to be able to read it anyway. Stood up, put both hands in my pocket, and he said to me, he said, Jerry, one more thing I want you to do. I want you to take this. He handed me a New Testament. Said the hardest thing this Jew has ever done in his life was to reach out and take that New Testament. I felt like I was going to bed with the enemy. I felt like that I was saying to Hitler, you're okay. I just, that was my thought. Now, I'm not saying all of those, any of that is reality, but that was my thought as that Jewish person at that time in that prison. And I found myself that next day in that ballroom to jump ahead again. And a friend of mine walked in and asked me, what are you doing, reading a Bible? And said, I believe I preached the first message I ever preached in my life. And without even knowing it, what I really wanted to say to this man, he was, by the way, I want you to understand, this guy stood about seven foot tall, name was Walter, scars all over his face. He was my bill collecting agency. I would send him after the money, he always come back with it. He was, couldn't fight a lick, but he was so big and ugly, nobody would try him, right? But he came in and he said, Jerry, what are you reading, a Bible? I, I started to say, did you put that in there? Are you trying to be funny or something and throw it? But that's not what I said. It was almost as if my mouth was out of control. I probably preached the first message. I told him what happened at that gate. I told him what happened at that off, it, with that old man in that chaplain's office. Told him what it was like reading this word for the last hour or so. I told him there's something happening in me. He pulled up a chair and asked me, he said, you believe Jesus would forgive me, Jerry, and come into my life? I said, and he had four life sentences that already killed three people since he'd been in the prison. I couldn't help but to tell him. I said, sure he would, Walter. Now, that was a miracle. But wait till you hear about not natural, but supernatural surgery when we come back. We will return to It's Supernatural right after this. But Jerry Golden, this prisoner, this hard thug who was really controlling things, drugs, etc., in, in Angola prison, had this life-changing experience. How did you change, Jerry? When Walter walked away from there that day crying, except he had accepted the Lord into his life, I had to find out if Yeshua really was Jesus. I had to find out if God really was alive. I had become a Jew who I didn't believe in anything. I was only a Jew just because I was born in a Jewish family. I found myself on my knees behind boilers in that boiler room, crying tears of joy and tears of repentance. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, filled my life. That was in 1968, and I have been so on fire for God ever since. He's the only thing. How did you change? You, you were a man that didn't have emotions. You just hate, hate, hate. How does that change? The interesting thing about salvation, you just don't get better. You become a new creature, and I became a new creature in Christ. I felt a newness and a freshness come, and come in me. I cried the whole front of my T-shirt full of tears of joy and tears of repentance as the Holy Spirit moved in my life and Jesus became the center of my life. And I knew that I knew that I knew that God was alive, that Jesus was... was but was. in February of 1976, Jerry, who had been released from prison, now is going back into prisons telling everyone of the change that happened to him and it can happen to them. And he's a pilot. He's flying away from the prison two other men with him, but something unusual happened. 
And I had been preaching in prisons for six years, been out of prison six years. I went to the Alabama State Prison and preached that day. And we got back to that plane. And when on takeoff, the front end baggage compartment came open. We lost all of our lifts, Sid. Uh, it was about 700 feet. My instrument said I was losing five to 600 feet a minute. I knew we were crashing. I just didn't know how or when. Mm -hmm. I'd done everything in the book trying to get the airplane to gain speed and overcome this problem, but it wouldn't. And I knew we were going to crash. We, the, God, we found out later, you did, it was in the fog, that God had flown that airplane underneath of a high power line, drug the tail through the only cattle gap in the, in the only field in that area, and crashed in the middle of a field with over a thousand cows and never hit a cow. And were you okay? Well, the, when, when the plane crashed, it instantly exploded. The, uh, pa the, the, uh, the pastor that was sitting beside me began to scream, a roaring fire inside of it. I reached over and grabbed these mouths with my left hand, and I saw God do something with this hand that a, that a hundred men wouldn't have the strength to do. Just rip the nylon seat belt like it was toilet paper and throw him out of the airplane. The door's on the right side of the airplane. Wait a second. Airplane. You actually... Broke? Ripped. That's ripped a nylon? Ripped it. Ripped I mean, it. that's supposed to hold a 250, 250 pound man. Ripped it like it was like toilet paper. Supernatural power just ripped it like it was toilet paper. I couldn't believe I'd done it myself as I, as I felt myself. Right, so ripped you ripped through. that and then what? I opened the door and I'm still holding his mouth. He wanted Why to keep were you holding his because mouth? Because he was screaming and there was roaring fire inside of the plane. And I knew if, it, if I didn't stop him from screaming, he was going to inhale all this fire and he's going to die. I, I had mm. that much presence of mind. And when I got him out of the plane, I remembered my singer was still in the back seat and I hollered with the only breath I had Larry and no answer came so I started in the back seat to grab a hold of him and pull him out and when I got to the middle two seat it was a six-seater airplane then another the, the gas tanks are in the wings another set of gas tanks exploded bouncing the airplane very violently and back onto the ground very violently and I found myself in the back of the plane the back door had been blown off and I, and I got out, realized at that point in time, the piece of the propeller was stuck into my skull. I tried to pull it out, and it was stuck so tight I couldn't pull it out, and it was sticking way out. And I had a double-knit suit on, and it was melting into my body. My clothes were literally on fire, and I got out of the plane knowing that running was the worst thing that I could do, but knowing that I had to get out of that fire and so I could breathe. I still wasn't breathing. And I ran as hard as I could, and I hit the ground, not knowing if I was out of the fire or not. By this time, my face was swollen, my eyes were swollen shut, and I, I didn't know where I was at. And I rode the best I could without bumping this piece of propeller sticking out of my brain. And, and, and I heard someone say, I see a light. The ambulance driver lived by the airport and had already got the report from the Methodist preacher's house that we flew over and already called. The doctor lived beside the airport. Everything was seemed to be sitting there ready for that. It was in three minutes the ambulance was coming down the road. I heard one of the, uh, the guys that was with me say, I see a light. I think it's an ambulance already. And they started walking. They grabbed the hold of me. I couldn't see. And we started singing praises to God. I said, let's just sing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How, how could you sing? Your, your body is burned. You must have, you, did you have pain at that pain point? Pain beyond anything I could ever describe. See, I've went through a lot of pain in my life. I've been shot three times and stabbed twice and run over, and, and I could write a whole book about pain, but I didn't know anything about pain until that day, until that afternoon, that evening in that field, in that cow pasture. As we was walking, I remember saying to God, God, you said you wouldn't place more on me that I could stand, and I had something happen to me that I've heard people say, and I, believe me, it, it really happens to people, I felt myself out of my body and looking at three men way down there, I mean way down there I could see three men walking in the field and realized the one in the middle was the one I called myself. How did yourself look? Oh, myself looked pathetic. I realized what self was really all about in relationship to a spiritual relationship with God. It was something happening in my life. We, ar we arrived at a fence, and they told me I'd have to help climb over the fence. They put my hands on it, and there was two young boys. It was a Methodist preacher's two high school sons who was football players. They told me after, since that time, that they, they got faint and nauseated and threw up. They couldn't help me because every time they would touch my arms or my back or any place, the fingers would slide into the burnt flesh and had a double knit suit on, have more double knit suit in the last, in all these years <laughs> since then, right? But it melted, literally melted into my body. They took me to the burn unit in, in Atmore, uh, not a burn unit, but the hospital in Atmore, and Dr. Stevens was a the doctor there, and he couldn't help me. The only thing he done was cut a wedding ring off of my finger, and he said, take him to the Mobile burn unit. He's 75% third degree burn, and I can't help him here. When I arrived at that burn unit, I heard a doctor tell a nurse, make this man, he didn't think I could hear him, he said, make this man as comfortable as you possibly can, he'll never make it through tonight. And brother, I started thinking, I have a better report than that. I know, I know the Lord thy God that healeth thee, 
And, and what it was, and I started thinking the scriptures, like, why is it easy to believe your sins be forgiven you and you can't believe you can say rise up and walk? I began screaming the name of Yeshua, Jesus, uh, as loud as I could. It was so loud I found out later it was, became a source of irritation for a lot of people. But, uh, well, I kept, what was it like when your wife saw you for the first time? My wife came down from Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. The next day a friend of mine put her in a private plane and flew her down. And when they brought me out in a little glass tube with hoses all over me, she didn't even believe it was me. My face was swollen so shut. She said, you couldn't even see my nose because it was swollen so shut. My eyes were swollen. They had to put petroleum jelly on Q-tips and open my eyes like that so I could see her. And then I would see three or four of her. It was just unbelievable the amount of wives I had standing out there that day. But she stayed there for the six weeks to follow, day in and day out. Uh, my wife, the Lord began to minister to me, I uh, said, most wonderfully through my wife. Uh, I, I, I would I'll make a little confession here very briefly. I was a little bit of a spiritual Archie Bunker at that point in time in my life. Mm -hmm. But God began to show me that he could really use my wife. And, and, uh, and he poured his spirit through her to me. And it was wonderful, the feeling, just knowing she was there. And the God, I, it was almost as if God was showing me I need to go to my wife to feel him, uh, to show us the oneness. Mm -hmm. And it had been something really special in her life ever yeah. since then. You were talking about pain. When, uh, for what I understand is they, you have to soak in hot water. Explain that. The treatment back then in 1976, and I, I think they still do it in some burn units. You know, they wrap you in gauze. My whole body was wrapped in gauze. To get the gauze off, after 24 hours, they settle and stick to your burn. So they have to put you down in hot water to get the gauze off. They put me on a winch, and my hand was already drawn up. My, my skin was all, you could see the bones in my fingers. You could see a bone in the top part of my leg. Uh, it was, they was wanting to amputate this leg. and want to amputate all the fingers on this hand, possibly the whole hand. Uh, they had, but that, that was the prognosis that at that point in time, and they would layer you down, lay you down very, very uh, uh, quickly into mm -hmm. this hot water. The moment the burns hit that 120 degree hot water, you would just pass out. You'd wake up and pass out until your body acclimated to it, and then they'd reach down and take all the gauze off. You'd under pass the water. out from the pain. From the pain. The pain would just absolutely knock you out. And then they would reach down and take the gauze down underneath of the hot water, and then when they pulled you out, you realize what a miracle skin is, because when you have nothing but raw meat of 70 5% of your body being attacked by the air, it's pain beyond any description. You really know what pain is when that happens to you. You just be, have to scream. And I chose to scream praises unto God. I chose to scream the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua. I chose to sing in Hebrew uh, uh, praises to God. I chose to do it, but as loud as I could. The doctor told me one day, he said, you know, the re after he changed his prognosis for that, that I would live, he said, you know, Jerry, why you have lived? He said, with your body burnt that badly, your blood couldn't get oxygen, but by the hyperventilation of screaming all the time, this thing about <laughs> Jesus, he said it was getting the needed oxygen for you to live. He said, that's why you live. Describe to me what your face looked like at the worst. Well, of course, I couldn't see my face, but I want to have my, and they didn't take any pictures. The pictures that they have was six weeks after. They didn't take pictures oh. of me. Well, tell me what they told you your face looked like. They told me they like. couldn't describe, they couldn't, there was no distinction between my eyes and nose. My face would just look like a burnt uh, a melon. It was just swollen up so bad. My earlobe and the back of my earlobe was completely burned off, and the bottom half of this lip was completely burned off. Uh, you know, to be healed is one thing, but to have a reconstructed lip and a reconstructed, and all the reconstruction God done on my face, that's miracles. Could, could, could plastic surgery have fixed you? They, they had plastic surgery in line. I, they had okay. me scheduled for dozens so, of operations. Well, but wait a second now. How many surgeries did you have on your face? None. None. Zero. But wait a second. I don't understand this. An earlobe cannot grow back. How did that happen? Only a miracle. Only God well, can your, do Your that. lips yeah. look fine to me. I'm telling you, God is, in, God is good. Sir. Your nose is there. <laughs> Your, your, what, what happened to your eyebrows? Or my your... eyebrows were burned off. It was all third degree burn across my face, across the whole. You're telling me you had no plastic surgery. No plastic surgery whatsoever. Someone did surgery on you. Yeah. We saw the pictures, and they weren't even the worst ones. I, I started talking to a better doctor. His name is Jesus, and I said, Jesus, Yeshua, I know that by your stripes I'm healed. Not going to be, not could be, but I will have already been healed, and I claim that healing. You know, Proverbs 6, 2 says, you're snared by the words of your mouth. So I begin to snare myself with some good words. I begin to stand on the promises. I believe, I begin to know that by his stripes I was healed, that he was my healer, not only my redeemer, not only my deliverer, but he was also my healer. And he began to do a miracle on my face. I, I, 
Hitler killed all of my family. The only family I have is my wife and my three, my four kids. It was three at that point in time. But at that point in time, I didn't want them to have to look at their daddy all burned up in the face. And I prayed extensively about my faith. I remember television. I, I couldn't see it. it. was at the foot of my bed. And I heard that all the churches in Monroe, Alabama, Mon, uh, Mobile, Alabama, were, were praying for the evangelist Jerry Golden. I thought to myself, if one of those people out there is a fanatic, I just need one person who's fanatic enough to really believe that Jesus really will heal me, not could or might or, or, or wanting to, but really will. I'm going to join in faith by that one person, and I know I'm healed. You know, the word fanatic is, is an objectionable type of word. But I'm reminded in the book of Revelations that Jesus said, I would rather you be hot or cold, in or out. But if you are just lukewarm, you go to church or synagogue on Sunday or Saturday, and uh, happy-go-lucky, lucky, and not a fanatic, this is what the Word of God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You don't hear that proclaimed too much, but that is truth, and the truth is, not if you go to church or synagogue, but if you know God. I mean, if you're intimate with Him. I don't believe Jerry could have survived in his right mind if he did not know God. He certainly would have had all sorts of plastic surgery. But those that know their God will be victorious. We're coming into a time in this world where you have to be in or out. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, I'm going to tell you something. I know God. I don't just believe in Him. I don't just intellectually know Him. I know Him. And Jerry, you know Him too. It's so wonderful to know God. There's nothing, nothing this earth has to compare to knowing God. They said I'd be in the hospital for the next five years. Six months later, I was completely healed, out flying an airplane, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Since that time, spent eight years in Israel, raised all my kids in Jerusalem, preached to God, been a missionary evangelist for all of these years since 19, and, and with, with, with a deeper knowledge of God and a deeper love for Him. To know Him, to know Him, there is nothing this earth has to compare, Jerry. Nothing, nothing.